Good morning and welcome. Thanks for giving up your time this morning. Um, we've had a really great turnout actually and I completely forgot that it's Melbourne Cup Day tomorrow. So I'm especially grateful that you turned up. I'll do my best to give you as much useful content as I can to make it worthwhile. You're taking 45 minutes out of your busy day. Now, because we have quite a few people registered, I think probably the best way to do this is if I share the information I have for you and then we do questions at the end. I um, hope that's okay. Um, if you've got any questions as we go, just click on, you'll see on your Zoom thing, you should have a Q&A button or a chat button. doesn't matter which one you use. Um, just type in your questions and I'll do my best to leave enough time to answer them. Um, I'll also try and keep an eye on that Q&A as we go. So if there's something that I don't explain clearly enough, then I'll try and backtrack and I'll scoop up those questions along the way. Um, and if you're logged in via your phone or something and you can't find the chat buttons, don't stress, just write the questions down and I can always answer them for you by email later on. Okay, let's get straight into this. Now, if you want to know more about us, I'll tell you at the end, but I know you've got lots to do, so I'll get right into the topic and I'm not going to waste your time spending 15 minutes telling you all about us. Um, all you probably need to know is that we've had our own RTOs, we sold one to a publicly listed company and we grew the other one to over 2,000 students a year and that was 98% fee for service. Now, we've also had some really stressful times in RTO land, so I've got a lot of sympathy or admiration, take your pick, um, for people who are still running them. Oops, let me just get this technology right. Okay, so first thing, um, let me try, I won't try to get too deep into the techie boring detail, but I just want to give you enough to be able to actually go away and implement at the end of this. Some of what you can do now in RTO marketing is pretty amazing in terms of the developments of technology in, in a pretty short time. Um, at the end of this, I'll give you half a dozen examples of RTOs we've worked with and what they've done to apply this stuff. And I'm also going to give you half a dozen things you can go away and do yourself today to start implementing. So just quickly, let me tell you a story from my own RTO experience. We'll put this in context and then we'll get on with the topics that were on the email. So about 15 years ago, I was running a small RTO doing mainly B2B sales. So um, we did leadership management, health and safety, quality assurance, what else? Oh, frontline management it was in those days and business. And I had a couple of salespeople who basically their job was to get on the phone and go find corporate clients for us. So, you know, it was that ring out, try and get to see them, write them emails and letters and things to try and get them to take our appointments. The, the typical, you know, back in the olden days, probably before you were born, um, way that things used to happen in RTO land. And I hired this guy, Michael, to be a copywriter for me because I had this idea that perhaps we'd have a better chance of getting appointments with these corporates if we wrote better letters to them in the first place to get in. He came in and he spent about a month or so observing what we did and then he came into my office one day and said can I talk to you about the way that you're recruiting students and I said yeah sure and he said um, I don't know how to tell you this but you're doing it all wrong. I was like okay great. I thought we were doing it pretty well, actually. Um, and in those days, we had about 200 students a year. So we're a small RTO, but, you know, we we're doing okay, I thought. And he said, why? He said, you're getting people to just get on the phone and, like, ring random training managers and say, have you got anyone who wants to do the course? And I said, yeah. And he said, that makes about as much sense as just walking up and down the street and going, hey, does anyone want to do the course? Which... Funnily enough, that's kind of how RTOs ended up a few years ago, didn't they, in the vet fee help era, but we won't talk about that. Um, and he said, why don't we just concentrate on enrolling students, selling courses to people who actually want to do training? Which, yeah, fine in theory, but how do you do that? Anyway, to cut that very long story short, he got us started doing some Google ads. And this is like 2004 or something. It's a pretty long time ago. And Google ads had only just come out. And he tried to persuade me to take some of the budget that we were spending on salespeople and put it into Google ads. And initially I was like, nah, that won't work. No one's going to do that. No one's going to use the internet to find a course. Uh -huh. um, anyway, we spent a little bit of budget on that. And within 12 months, we had, or three and a half months, we'd tripled our business. Within 12 months, we're up to 1,500 students. And within the next couple of years, we ended up in the BRW Fast 100 for fastest growing RTOs. 
Now, that's all fine, but you know, that was in the olden days. Um, but one of the things that we learned from that was how important it is to find, I guess, the right channel to get your students in and use that channel. And it will change. I mean, for us, Google Ads went really well for a while until everybody jumped in there and then all the people with all the vet feet and help money jumped in there and that was the end of that. But what's been really interesting in the last couple of years, and the reason that that story is still relevant today, is that there's a whole lot more automation, technology, big data, if you want to call it that, which can allow you to recruit students and can automate a lot of that process in a really personalized way. And one of the things I know that people get hung up on with any kind of automation of marketing and recruitment is they say, yeah, but what's good about my RTO is we have that personal touch. And it's like, yeah, absolutely. And how much more of a personal touch can you have if you're automating all the boring, repetitive things and you're just spending your time on caring for your students and talking to them about the stuff that they need to be talked about? Making sense so far, hopefully. So here's what we're going to cover today. Um, and the first topic about big data, I think is really interesting. That once upon a time, like a year ago, it was pretty much only like the big banks and the supermarkets and the odd American presidential candidate that could use big data. Um, you've probably seen on the news a bit of controversy about using big data for targeting, especially in things like the US elections. Um, just as an aside, if you haven't seen The Great Hack on Netflix, you should probably watch it. It's a little bit scary. But we can actually, as RTOs, we can use big data for good to help our students find us. So if you're one of the good guys, if you're one of the decent RTOs that's actually giving people courses that will potentially change their career and change their life, then I think that's a pretty good use of the data. Um, let me give you an example of how this big data stuff, this first topic, is used in real life. And then later in the session, I'll show you some really simple ways that you can get access to this yourself in a really cost-effective way. Now, you might... You probably already know this and you've probably seen stuff on the news about it, but let me put it in a context and how it applies to RTOs. I'll give you a non-RTO example first and then I'll give you an RTO example. So let's imagine that you are thinking of going on a camping holiday. Let me pick somebody who's in there like all good trainers do. We'll pick Angie. Okay, Angie, you're thinking of going on a camping holiday and so you... This is, this is how big data works at the moment in Australia and small companies can use it. You might walk into boating, camping and fishing or one of those camping type shops. Now, you don't buy anything. You don't log in. You don't check in on Facebook. You don't search for it on the map because you know where it is. You just walk in there and you don't even touch your phone. You're astute enough and experienced enough in um, technology to have turned off location services on your phone because you don't want to be tracked. But you walk into boating, camping and fishing, you walk around, you spend a bit of time hanging around looking at the tents, and then you walk out again. Now, what happens is your, your phone then sells that piece of data that says that you've been to that place to one of the big technology companies. The way that they do that is there's a whole bunch of apps and games and things like that on your phone that you have probably never thought about when you signed the terms and conditions. So say you're playing Candy Crush or something like that. You, When you joined to play Candy Crush, there were 32 pages of terms and conditions. You ticked, yes, I want to play it. Um, and somewhere amongst all of that, it said, we consent to, um, I consent to you collecting my data and you can find out my location. Um, you'll see if you do Googling, I think the ACCC is um, suing Google at the moment for sneakily collecting people's locations but anyway so Angie you've walked into boating camping and fishing you have walked around and left your app on your phone has said Angie's been here and they've taken that piece of information and they've sold it to one of the companies like Axiom or Experian or one of those big data companies they don't know what that means it's just a fact about you it's one data point then you might message um, your friends or family and say what do you think about going camping these holidays in the process of messaging that, unless you're using WhatsApp or one of the encrypted apps, if it's just using a normal messenger app, it's going to pick up the keyword camping. And it's going to add that to the bucket of things that we know about Angie. So she's walked into boating, camping and fishing and she's used the keyword camping in a message. Then you might do the things that you know to get tracked, like you might search for camping grounds on Google Maps or something like that. That gets added to the pool of information. And 
then you might do something like buy something with your credit card or flybys card, rewards card, something like that. And that little piece of information gets tracked. Say you've bought a gas cooker or whatever. So then if I come along and I'm an online shop and I sell sleeping bags, I could go to someone like Experian or some, someone like that. And for probably less than $100, I can say to them, give me all the people who are showing intent to go camping. Now, the cool thing about that for me, if I was a sleeping bag seller, is that instead of trying to pay for a Google keyword and being up against all the other people that are selling sleeping bags and having to compete on price and everything, I'm asking for the people who are intending to go camping and haven't yet shown any evidence that they've purchased a sleeping bag. So there's nothing on their credit cards or there's nothing on their online shopping that says that they've bought one. And then I can drop my ads all over the internet just in front of those people and I'm only paying to advertise to those people, which I will explain today how you do that. So it's kind of terrifying and cool all at once really, isn't it? Um, now where this applies to RTOs is you can do the same sort of a thing. So we did a project recently for an RTO where we, they had a diploma of project management that they were marketing and they were trying to figure out who their perfect student was. So we did a bit of an analysis of who their students were, and I'll show you in a moment how to do that. Um, and in that analysis, we found out some interesting things about them. So they knew, I mean, like, you know, most of us know roughly who our students are. We know that our students, so in that case, they knew that they were mostly male, they were mostly tradies, and they were guys that were wanting to get off the tools and do project management instead. So once we did a bit of an analysis, we ran a tool that I'll show you in a moment through the, the student list. We had their name, their email address and their mobile number, ran this tool through it. And we found out a whole lot more about them, not as individuals, like there is still some privacy left in the world, thank goodness. Um, but as a cohort, we found out some things they had in common. So we found out, yes, they were male. Yes, they were tradies. They were mostly aged between 30 and late 40s. They were married most of them most of them had a mortgage uh, most of them had children in primary school and they were buying lots of painkillers at the pharmacy so that's where this and i'll explain to you how we found all that out in a moment but that's where this stuff is the overlap if you like between technology and psychology so the technology will help you find out all that stuff but then the psychology is well what does that mean what are, what are these guys, why are they doing project management? And you can kind of look at that, that data and it tells you the story and it basically says, to me anyway, that these are men with commitments who can't just quit their jobs, but they've got sore bodies and they need to get off the tools because they're getting to an age and a stage in their career where their bodies are starting to hurt and they're starting to think, I can't be crawling around in a roof space for the rest of my life, I have to do something else. And they go and do project management. So basically we purchased that audience for this RTO and we, we dropped some content, um, mainly the platform we used for this one was Facebook, but there are other platforms, which I'll show you. And the content was saying things like, do you want to get off the tools? Do you not want to spend another year crawling around in a hot roof space in the summer? Have you thought about doing project management as a career? Click here to download a careers guide to project management. So it's not saying do our course and do it with us. It's the very start of the process, which is, think about this as a career and then there was a sequence of things that happened that nurtured them. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Feel free to say yes or no in the chat. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that you can do. Now let me just show you something though and one of the biggest obstacles probably to being able to do this. Okay, this one I just want to show you. So I will skip over a few slides. Oh, thank you, people that said it makes sense. Thank you. Um, so this is from a company called Martech. The website, if you want to go and have a look at it, is chiefmartech.com. What they do is every year since 2011, they have made a list of all the tools that are around for marketing and automation and sales automation and things like that. So you'll see that back in 2011, there were about 150 tools. There was, I don't know, Facebook, Google Ads, whatever, whatever. And so it was not unreasonable for you to get, to be able to be across at least a good chunk of those. Um, if you look at where we were at in 2019, there are something like 7,030 or something of them now. 
I've just zoomed in a little bit so you can see what it looks like. All these different trolls. So it's kind of insane to think that we can ever be in, across them. It's insane to think that we can ever be across them and run an RTO and be across all the compliance stuff at the same time. So one of the things that, that I think is worth doing is just picking every year the one or two tools that are most likely to work at the moment and focusing and going deep on those. So you'll see on this zoomed in one, um, in the mobile marketing section down towards the bottom right, there's a thing that says Live Ramp. Live Ramp is a company out of Singapore who actually collects all the Australian data. So they stuff I was talking about before, they collect all the information about who we are, what we do, where we go, what we talk about, what we buy, what we're thinking about. And and we, as as, as RTOs and as RTO marketers, we can buy information from them to, to choose a particular audience to market to. Now, of course, what works for someone selling sleeping bags or bikinis is not going to work for RTOs, probably. And what worked last year is probably not going to work next year. But there are a couple of basic principles that are universal. So I thought, if it's okay with you, I'll talk briefly at the high level about the principles and then I'll talk tactics in terms of what you can actually do. Okay, so two things to consider and this does not matter what decade we're in, what tools we're using, using whatever it is. We need to be able to attract inquiries and then we need to be able to convert them to enrolment. Now about 12 months ago when we started doing this consultancy, we sort of became accidental consultants as you do when you're sitting around being semi-retired going what am I going to do with myself and people start asking you to help and a few people started saying oh can you help me get more leads and we started doing that and then what you find half the time is the problem is not getting more leads a lot of RTOs are actually attracting enough interest in the first place it's just that they're not converting that interest into actually enrolling and as you know you can buy leads in lots of places but getting them to enroll is another story so I thought we would talk about two things. We talk about how do you attract them in the first place. So how do you get them to go from I've never heard of you to I might like to do a course with you. And then how do you get them to go from I might like to do a course with you to I've enrolled and I've paid some money. Right. So attracting inquiries. There's a few different ways. I'm just going to pull all these up at once and talk to them all at the same time. I'm conscious that I'm only end up talking to you guys for like three hours and you probably haven't got three hours to spare. And I think the Zoom thing's going to cut off after an hour anyway. Okay, so attracting inquiries. Google Ads, which I mentioned that that's how we started off doing it. Um, quite a few people have done it. I'll talk to about a couple of tricks of the trade for that in a moment. But one of the things that you'll see on that list is one thing that's not on there is word of mouth. Now, a lot of businesses in general and a lot of the very small RTOs in particular that I've talked to over the last year or so say, oh, we get all our students by word of mouth. Now, as soon as you say that, you know a couple of things about them. One of the things that you know is that they're small. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting students by word of mouth. That is awesome and that means that you're actually doing a good job. Um, because the very best way to know if your RTO is doing what it should be doing is if your students are recommending that their friends come. And small is fine if you want to be small and there's definite advantages to being small in any kind of business. The big disadvantages of staying small, I think though, for and getting all your students from word of mouth, one is RTO specific and one's not, is that for RTOs with the compliance costs and the overhead and with the way that they're increasing and with this discussion again about cost recovery and increasing the compliance costs um, this, if you're too small it's just not viable and the other thing is what if you need more students for some reason so if you don't have a systemized scalable proven process for getting students then that's kind of leaving your students in your future in the hand of the outside world and just hoping that you're going to get more word of mouth and I don't know about you, but I'm too much of a control freak to cope with that. I need to be able to have a tap that I can turn on and turn off as needed. And so know what, know that I'm going to have revenue next year, know what's going to happen. So let's have a look at these items on this slide. Um, the first one that you know, I'm sure, but let me just show you a little Google twist, which might help you get better results out of Google. Um, I'd be interested to know actually how many people here are using Google Ads. Um, just if you are using them, if you could comment, that would be awesome. Thank you. Just yeah, put your hand up if you are. Thank you, Sasha. Okay, there's a few. And some people have tried them and yeah, given up. 
yeah, and that was I was just saying we used them, then we stopped. And one of the reasons we stopped is because there were so many people dived in there and were spending so much money. Right. So I am actually sitting in a hotel in New Zealand today, which is why these are New Zealand links because I just grabbed some. Excuse my Kiwi accent. Um, yeah, and that's interesting. A few people are saying they did use Google Ads but didn't make any money. So let me show you why. A couple of reasons usually. Um, so. I mean, Google Ads is the most common paid traffic thing. Probably Facebook sort of picked up, but Google was more. Um, actually, someone's just asked if you'll get the slides after the training. You can if you like. If you want them, just um, let me know, or I'll put a link on our website or something. We'll talk about it at the end. But yeah, we are recording it. So if you want a copy of the slides and if you want the audio as well, you're welcome to have it. Now I'll just have to figure out how to get it to you. So these are New Zealand. So I was sitting here this morning and I thought, let me find an example to show you. And I googled um, Diploma of Beauty Therapy, which is probably a good thing I got some New Zealand ones, actually, because if I'm about to bag them, it's probably a good thing they're not Australian RTOs. <laughs> so I googled it. And as you know, when you go on Google, this is what you get. I googled Diploma of Beauty Therapy. So if I was a student, that's what I'd be doing. And you can see that the few at the top have got the little word add with a little green box around it before the domain name. Those are the ones that are paying. And then the one right down at the bottom doesn't have ads. So they've actually managed to get there because their keywords are working, et cetera, et cetera. Now, people are paying a lot of money for this. So as anyone who's doing Google Ads knows, if you're paying for a Google Ad, there are four costs to consider. There's the cost per click. So you're bidding on the keywords. So if, you've, if you're bidding on the phrase Diploma of Beauty Therapy, and you probably know that you can bid on that in a few different ways. So you can bid on it as an exact phrase that you only want the people who put in those exact words. Or you can bid on some or all of the words or any of the words, whatever. And there's some things that you need to be careful of there, like making sure that you're not going to be getting everybody who's just looking for beauty therapy because you're going to get all the people looking for, you know, eyebrows or whatever as well. You just want the students. So be careful with that. Otherwise, you waste a lot of money. One of the things to do in Google is make sure you have lots and lots of exclusions that you're not paying for. So four costs to consider. The cost per click, which I haven't actually looked at beauty therapy in New Zealand, but I'd be guessing it's probably something like $4, maybe $5 per a click. So that doesn't mean you're getting a lead from it. That just means every time someone clicks on that ad, they're paying at least, the provider is paying at least a couple of dollars for them to click. The next cost that you need to consider is the cost per lead. So how many of those clicks are actually going to turn into an inquiry? And you should know that about yourself. You should know, okay, it costs us $50 per Google actual inquiry, whatever. There's then some retargeting costs, which I'll explain shortly. And then, of course, there's the actual cost per enrollment. So you might be paying, say, $3 for the lead, $50 for them to have actually put in the inquiry, and then one in four of them are enrolling, so you're paying $200 for the enrollment. Actually, these days, conversion rates on digital leads are probably more like 5 to 10%. So you're probably paying you know, more like $400 or $500 for that enrollment. But let me show you a couple of examples. So I clicked on the first couple just to see what we do. So these people have paid a lot of money to send somebody to their website. Let me show you the first one. So, and that's what it looks like. So it looks pretty. Nice picture. That's a Pahutakawa for those people that don't know New Zealand plants, beautiful New Zealand Christmas tree, nice page, pretty picture, not going to do anything. There's no call to action there. That's That screenshot is everything that I could see above the fold, as they call it, which is everything I can see without scrolling down. So if I'm a student and I come there, there's nothing to grab my attention. There's nothing to tell me that I should enroll. There's nothing to grab me and get me to leave my details. I would say that these guys are paying a lot of money for Google clicks and not getting a lot of inquiries off it. So let me show you the next one. If it will work, my click. Okay, this one's a bit better. Um, these guys, this was the first page that I ended on. This is what's above the fold. So you can see on the left, you're actually giving them a call to action, which is to download a free prospectus. And there's also a button towards the bottom under courses, want more info. It's not perfect. One of the things that you really, if you're driving Google traffic, you just want one thing for them to do when they get to the page. So there's a few too many options here. You know, you could download the prospectus, you can get information, you can click on the want more info button. Um, the more options you give people, the fewer things they're likely to do. So you've got enroll now at the top here, and you've got search, you've got follow us on Facebook, there's too much stuff going on. So it's much better than the other one, at least they're going to be getting some leads out of it, but they could 
simplify that landing page as they call it and get a lot more leads now one of the things you have to think about if you're doing google ads and we're not going to spend too much time on google ads but just to bear in mind is that you need to think about how are you going to get the most how are you how are you going to get them to want to give you their details like when we started do, doing google ads in ancient history times you could pretty much say leave your details here to get some course information and they would leave it now these days and especially generation z and millennials they don't want to give up their details just to get a course brochure like there's what's in it for them they'll just keep googling and they'll go and find a provider that will give them the information without having to give up their details because they know that you're going to try and sell them something they're not silly and so they don't want to have to give up their details for nothing prospectus may be in a beauty college yeah because there's probably going to be more in it but if they're just looking to do you know a business diploma or something like that and you're just one of many business diplomas that's not going to get really exciting one of the things that we've found works really well as a lead magnet, as in the thing that you give them to get them to part with their contact details and be on your mailing list, is at the moment something that's working really well is information about the career rather than the course itself. So one of the reasons that we managed to set, grow our beauty college so big, and we had a beauty therapy college for a while, which is the one we sold to a public company, is every other beauty college in Brisbane people would inquire about the college and they would tell them all about the subjects. They'd say, you're going to do anatomy and physiology and massage and blah, blah. When we met with prospective students and those courses, I mean, that's 10 years ago and those courses were $11,000 each, fee for service, no vet fee help or anything. So it was, it was not an easy thing to, to sell. Um, we would talk to the students about their future, about what they were going to do with their lives and they could work on a cruise ship or in a day spa in Paris or what would they do? And a lot of them barely even looked at the subjects. They just wanted to be beauty therapists. So one of the things you need to think about with your courses is what are you actually selling? You're not selling a course. The course is a commodity. You're selling the outcome and you're selling the life that they're going to have and the career that they're going to have when they've done your course. So if you're going to give them something to exchange in exchange for their details you probably need to be giving them something that is related to that career that's going to get their attention and catch their eye does that make sense hopefully i keep asking you that but i'm not you're all unmuted so <laughs> it doesn't okay so now let me show you we talked i mentioned a moment ago remarketing so here's something that's really important these guys are paying all this money for people to come to their site if they come to their site and they leave without downloading a prospectus and leaving the details, then you've paid all this money to get them and you don't know who they are and you can't talk to them, right? And if you've got a really good landing page from your Google Ads, you might be getting, say, 15 to 20% of the people that visit the page will fill out some sort of a form. But that means 80 to 85% of the people that visit the page are going to leave and never leave you the details which is an awful waste of money it means that for every every click that you're paying for you're wasting four now you'll see if you look at the top of the screen um i probably can't highlight it for you without clicking on but if you look at where the domain name is which says elitebeautyschool.co.nz domestic courses and then all the blah blah go across to the right of that and you'll see the little star for the favorites and then you'll see a little blue box with the green number two on it can you see that so that little box is a little tool that we've got. Um, it's a plugin for Chrome and it's called Facebook Pixel Helper. And that tells us that they've got a tracking code on their website. Now there's two main, and this is something I'm going to show you today before we finish. You can put this on your site today if it's not there. Um, so I would go to Chrome and I would download the Chrome plugin called Facebook Pixel Helper. And then I would go to your website and I would have a look. And if you don't have those little, that little green box with a number in it, if it's just grayed out, that means you've got no tracking code on your website. And that means that you can't follow up people who visited your site but didn't inquire. Now, two main types of tracking code that everybody should have on their site. You should have the Facebook tracker and you should have the Google tracker. So that means that someone's come in through, it doesn't matter, they could come through Google, paid Google, they could just find you, someone could tell you they're, that you'll tell them your website doesn't matter somehow they've ended up upon your website but you don't know who they are with that tracker you can then chase them around the internet 
So you can drop stuff in their Facebook feed. And, and the, the beauty of that is instead of paying a fortune to advertise to everybody, it's the difference between television advertising, where you're throwing an ad on the TV, showing it to a million dollars, and hopefully a hundred people, a million dollars, a million people, I mean, and hopefully a hundred people out of those million are your potential students, or just showing your ad to the hundred potential students. So if you do it this way and use the tracker, you can just pay afterwards to advertise to the potential students who have already been to your site. So on Facebook at the moment, and I'll show you, this is not Facebook boosting posts, it's nothing to do with that, and I'll show you what it actually is in a moment. But you might pay at the most, maybe like $50 to show your ad to a thousand people. It's like crazily cheap. The plugin is free, the pixel is free, and you're paying next to nothing to show the ad to people. So if you're not doing that, you absolutely should be. You're leaving lots of students on the table, lots of money on the table. So the plugin, the Facebook plugin will give you a Facebook audience and you can show your ads to those people. The Google plugin will do the same thing. And you'll have seen the Google plugin in action if you, this is not Google search, this is a different thing. If you are um, reading the newspaper online or something and I did it recently, I was looking at some clothes online, looked at these three dresses, couldn't decide which one to buy, and then everything I looked at on the internet, not on Facebook, but just generally, I was like reading the Australian online, and you know how they have those boxes at the bottom which are like the little ads and things, they look like articles but they're actually ads, and one of those boxes in the bottom, here appears one of the dresses that I'd looked at, and those dresses just chased me around the internet for a week. And then after a week, I thought, no, oh, I really should do something. I'd kind of half forgotten. Then the next thing that popped up in one of the things I was reading online was one of the dresses with a big out of stock slash across it. I was like, oh, no, I'm going to miss out. So it gave me some good FOMO. So I jumped back on their website, looked again at the dresses that were still in stock. Of course, they knew that I'd done that. They still didn't know my name and address, but they knew who I was. They could identify me as a digital piece of information. So they're like, she's been here. She's looked at these three dresses. Now she's clicked on our ad and she's come back. And I still didn't buy. And then because I was actually already signed up with this clothing store as a customer, they then had this little thing, which I'll show you in a second as well, which was a bridge that joined up the advertising with their email database. And they sent me an email that said, um, we've got three dresses for the price of two for the next 24 hours. And I'm like, that solves my problem. I don't need to buy them. I just bought them all. So... You can do all that stuff relatively simply if you have the Google targeting code and the Facebook targeting code on your on your page. Um, when we get to the end, if there's any things that you need me to show in more detail, then I can quickly do that. Okay, so let me show you now the other thing to think about. that. So that was talking about finding brand new students, but what if you could clone your really good students? So, you know, one of the things in RTO land that, there's kind of two lots of people out there. There's the ones who enroll, and it would be nice to have more of those, but then there's the ones who enroll and actually complete, and whether you're funded or not funded, those are the ones that you really want. So what if you could just clone the ones who completed your course? So three ways that you can do that. I'm gonna show you the easiest way to do that using Facebook, and then I'll briefly explain the big data way, um, and if we've got time, we'll talk a bit more about the Google way. So let me show you how you can find your student characteristics from the data that you've already got. So for those, some of you will recognize this. If you have um, Facebook Business Manager, now there are three things in Facebook, if you like, that you can have as a business. There's a Facebook page, which, which I'm sure everybody's got. Then there's a Facebook ad account, which if you've been boosting posts or doing anything like that, you've probably got one. Like that's when you put your credit card in to pay for stuff. But the really powerful tool in Facebook uh, is the Facebook Business Manager. And Facebook Business Manager is, you can link it up to your ad account on your page, but it is a separate animal. It's not actually part of your page. It's not part of your ad account. And in Facebook Business Manager, if you go in the back there, you can find out a ton of things about your existing audience. Now I've screenshotted these because this is a client of ours and I didn't want to include their name in it obviously. Um, but if anyone can't find this just give me a holler on email and we've made a little loom video that can show you how to click through to find it and I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, so when you go into your Facebook business manager there's a drop-down menu at the top and you go to this section called audience insights. So 
go to business manager if you haven't got a business manager set up you can just google how to set up a facebook business manager and that will take you to a link a facebook link that you click on and it will just step you through the process it's really easy um, but you've probably got a page but you don't necessarily have this part set up so when you're in business manager there's like three little lines at the top left like a little hamburger menu thing you click on that and you choose the item called audience insights and it will take you to this so this is a section that tells you who is who's currently interacting with you either on your facebook page but also on your website as long as you've got that facebook tracking code that i showed you a second ago as long as you have that on your website then this tells you about all your website visitors not just the people that are on your Facebook page. In fact, you don't even need to be using your Facebook page. You can still put that little pixel on your site to track everybody. A lot of RTOs don't bother having much Facebook activity, and that's fine. And half of us spend our time going, oh, we should do something on our Facebook, I know. But it's like, you know what? With Facebook pages, it's pretty much pay to play these days. You can do all this posting on your page, but unless you pay Facebook money, hardly anyone's going to see them anyway. So I wouldn't get too hung up on, I mean, some people are doing a great job of it and carry on, but for the rest of us, I wouldn't get too hung up on worrying about your Facebook page. I'd be more inclined to just use the Facebook tools to keep things going. How are we going for time? Oh, I better speed up. Okay, so this is one of the things that you'll find when you go to Audience Insights and Facebook page. So this RTO, you can see there's four tabs across the top, demographics, page likes, location, and activity. So the first thing it tells us about her, her training company is 94% of the people that come to her website are women, 6% male. So the pale blue of those bars in the menu is her audience, the darker blue is the whole of Facebook. So on Facebook as a whole, and this is interesting, isn't it? This is for Australia, we've, we've narrowed it down to Australia for hers, um, obviously. For Australia as a whole, 44% of Facebook users are women. Now we assume that that it's mostly women on Facebook and looking at pictures of kittens, in fact, but no, the blokes are on there too. Anyway, her audience is mostly female. So when she's producing content and when she's doing stuff, that's something that she needs to know because she's talking largely to women. Now, then I scrolled down a bit and I took another screenshot. If I can get it to come up. And I found out more about their relationship status. So the people that visit her site, and this is, remember, this is visiting her site. This is not her Facebook likers. Are, quite a lot of them are more single than the average Facebook user and less married. <laughs> so, okay, her students are female and they're heavily skewed towards single. I mean, still, you know, more of them are married than usual, but they are heavily single. And a lot of them, well, they're about the same number of the universities as everyone else, but a lot of them are high school educated. So that immediately gives us some information once again as she's talking to her students about the language that she should use, the topics, you know, how she should connect with them. Then we clicked on one more page. We then went across the tab to the next one. And we can you can keep going. We won't spin ages. This is the last screenshot I did. But I went, okay, what else are her people interested in? The people who visit her page, um, and you'll see from this that she's, a sun, she's on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Um, the people who visit her page, what are they like? What are they interested in? Well, interestingly, the top thing that they were interested in was this photographer called Gregarious Peach. When you look at this photographer, she photographs um, families and young children. Um, they really like, this is the top 10 things that they like, her audience, as a whole, as a cohort. They like the Woodford Folk Festival. They like Crystal Castle, Mulaney Dairies, which is the organic milk, natural therapy pages. So they're kind of like nature-oriented single mother hippies probably <laughs> um and so yeah try the quit sugar thing being healthy you can kind of see what makes them tick so when she's putting together content to market her course she knows how to talk to these people she knows who they are she knows she can figure out this tribe she can figure out their voice and she can talk to them so you can do that pretty much now you can go in and do that if you set up business manager you can go into audience insights as long as you've got that Facebook tracking code on your site. If you don't have it, stick it on today because it doesn't retrospectively track. So you'll need to start collecting information from today forward to know. Because imagine how your marketing material could look if you knew who you were talking to. We think we know who our students are, but we don't know who the people are that have been and gone and not stuck around and talked to us. Now, okay, so if you don't know, you haven't got the tracking code, so you have no idea who, you, who the people are, but you want to go and target an audience then this is what you do. 
Now, there are two big data companies who you can buy data from in Australia. One of them is called Experian, and one of them is, or well, there are more than two, but there's two that we've used. The other one is called Axiom. Experian owns LiveRamp, which was that one I mentioned earlier. That's the Singapore-based one. So they've got a. Experian's had a few issues with American elections and things like that. So they've. I don't know. If, I don't know if that's got anything to do with it, but I've noticed the brand they're using in in Australia is um is a different brand. They're using LiveRamp. So you can go to those companies and you can say, give me an audience. And this is not mailing list brokers. Like for those of you that are old like me, you will remember the days when you could go to a mailing list broker and get names and addresses or whatever of all the people that was, that were had previously put their dogs in the kennels for the holidays or something like that you know um, these are not mailing lists they don't give you the person's name or anything because privacy you know some such that it is but you can go to them and say i want an audience of people who are showing the intent to go back to study and are interested in I don't know, whatever it is that you're teaching. Say you're teaching health and safety. They want to go back to study and are interested in workplace health and safety. And they basically troll through, like the example I was giving you before about the, the camping and the, the going to boating, camping and fishing. They troll through all their data points and they come up with a bucket of people who have shown intent to go back to study and study workplace health and safety. And when you think about it, there's all kinds of stuff, isn't there, that we do before we take some sort of an action. So we might be, um, if we're thinking of studying safety, the chances are we might have been, you know, looking at some accident reports on the website or on websites and things. Um, we might have visited one of the safety supplies stops. We, shops, I don't have to speak English from New Zealand. Um, we might ask what we've done. We might have talked to our spouse and saying, what do you think about me going back to study next year? Can we afford it? What will we do? You might have googled online courses like there's a bunch of stuff that this person would have done in the early stages of them thinking about studying the good thing about it is when you get these people it's like for the sleeping bag person instead of you being on google when they search diploma of workplace health and safety and being up against all the dodgy 400 hundred dollar diploma people and having to try and compete with that and then having to try and convince the student when you talk to them that they shouldn't do the rubbishy course they should actually do a decent one um, you can get them before they get to Google. So you, you buy the data off Axiom or Experian, you upload it into Google or Facebook, and then, like I was saying about the example with the dresses, wherever they go on the internet, they're going to see your content. You just talk to them. I hope I'm not making this confusing. Can someone tell me whether I'm making this confusing or whether this is making sense? I do tend to get bogged down in the detail. Sorry, I'll try and step out of the detail a little bit, get back out of the forest. Okay, so remarketing or retargeting. The reason that that's important is that is going to halve your lead costs potentially. Because you can imagine someone comes to your site and then you chase them around the internet a little bit and you only pay to chase those people. It's going to cost you a lot less than just getting a cold lead. Now, I've got a couple of quick sequences to show you. We are nearly out of time. I can't believe it. Okay, I'll go really fast. Maybe I'll send you some, send you guys some of these slides rather than go through them in great detail because your brains are going to get full otherwise, aren't they? So this slide here is basically a sequence of how, if you're going to run content in Facebook to these targeted audiences, how you do it in a sequence. It's not a static thing. You don't just run a post going, buy my thing. You don't do a post that goes, roll for my course you have a series of posts that they see one after the other. So it might be a video, first of all, which is a testimonial from someone about their great career that they're having in project management. And after they've watched that video, you know that if they've watched that video, the business manager tells you, and then you automatically flick them, the video viewers, to the next ad, which might be inviting them to an open day or something like that. And then that automatically flicks them to the next. So this is all automated once it's set up might send them to a landing page with a registration. Um, then it might send them to, once they've attended the event, it might automatically send them some sort of reminder. So you set up a sequence of automation where you show them pieces of content based on what they do. I'm gonna to have to go through this a bit quicker. Sorry guys, but if maybe we'll do another one another day if anyone wants to see how we go, if you're interested. So here is this sort of stuff. Here's a couple of examples of little ads and I'm showing you these because just very quickly so typically you know normal ad the one on the left you want to give a forklift license click to learn more 
as soon as they see that, you drive them to a landing page, which is just specifically get information. And then to keep the momentum, as soon as they've gone to the landing page, the click then is a trigger for them to see another piece of content, which might be a testimonial from someone with their great new life as a forklift driver or something like that. Now, I wanted to show you this one on the right too. This was a school-based traineeship one that we did where I had to really convince the RTO CEO to let us run this peculiar looking picture, this leopard print. Because most people just go, oh, we're just going to do stock photos of, you know, two people sitting around a computer and blah, blah. But when you're on Facebook, when you're on any kind of social media, you're just scrolling through, right? This is thumb scrolling through. And if you see stock photos, you don't even stop because that immediately says to you, this is an advertisement. So the point of the image in Facebook content posts is just to get their thumb to stop, just to get people to go, huh, what? Now, this school-based traineeship one, we figured out really quickly, we're not advertising this to the kids or even the teachers, we're advertising it to the mothers. We thought we were targeting the parents and then we discovered that fathers didn't really respond. Sorry, dads. But mothers spend their half their life worrying about their year 11 and 12 kids and what are they gonna do when they leave school? And mothers, people my age, apparently we like leopard print. <laughs> so that leopard print ad went crazy. We got we were getting good warm leads of parents who were seriously interested in their kids doing the school based training for shit for like four dollars each or something. So what else have I quickly got to show you before we get out of time? Okay, so just quickly summarize that attraction side. So Google Ads, we talked about the lookalike audiences, which is basically take your existing students and find more people like them. Um, and you can actually, with that lookalike audiences, you can actually um, go into Facebook and specifically and say, you create a thing called a custom audience. Once again, if you go into audiences, and it says create custom audiences, you click that button and it says, who do you want to copy? And you say, I want lookalikes like the people that have been to my website or whatever. So you can copy your existing ones. You don't even have to buy data. Facebook targeted marketing, we talked about that. Landing pages, we talked about that. As someone said in the chat, I see, have I got a good example of a landing page? Yes, they're actually harder to find, but I can grab some and um, send them to you or pop them on our Facebook or something. Let me know if you want me to send you a couple. Really simple, basically plenty of white space, simple one call to action and a good reason to do it is really the key to a good landing page. Lead magnets, we just briefly touched on. So give them a reason for giving you their details. Give them something cool like, even if it's a careers guide or something else, have a think about what do your students want to know before they enroll that you can give them that they're not going to expect to just find on the internet without having to part with their details. We didn't talk about geo-targeting, haven't really got time, but you can, using Facebook and using a whole bunch of other platforms, you can target people based on the location that they're in or where they live or where they've been. This isn't boosting posts, this is a different thing. So for example, if there was a careers expo on in the convention center and you didn't want to pay the $10,000 to have a booth there and pay your staff and set up all the stuff and do there to have a whole bunch of school students coming through and running off with all your brochures, that's what usually happens, at least happened to us, you basically geotarget the convention center. You say, I want to run my ads to anybody who was in this location on these days. And then all the people that went to the convention center get to see your content and you don't have to pay to show it to anyone else. Okay. Just quickly, converting to enrollment, and I am really going to rattle through this in case we have got some questions. So the leads have come in, that's fine. What are you going to do with them when they get in? One of the things when you're doing any kind of digital lead generation is you're going to get a lot of leads. So if you switch this on and you spend, I don't know, $500 a week, say, on this advertising, you're going to get probably up to 100 inquiries. And most of us are not set up to handle 100 inquiries, particularly when probably 90 to 95 of those inquiries are not going to enroll. There are people that are, oh, I was just looking at cat videos on Facebook and I thought it looked interesting or whatever. Or you, you get a lot of people. And anyone who's tried any kind of Google ads or Facebook ads before will know that you get a lot of people that are not ready to enroll now or not going to enroll at all. And the fastest way to demoralize any kind of salesperson on the phone or enrollment coordinator is to make them call 95 people who don't want to talk to them. It's really disheartening and they come back and go, oh, these leads are rubbish. And they find it hard to find the five little gold nuggets amongst the hundred leads because they get burned out by calling the others. So I would really suggest if you're going to do any kind of digital advertising that you have a really strong automated evergreen process of nurturing those inquiries when they come in automatically and filtering through until you get to the ones who are actually keen and just get your humans to talk to the ones who are keen. 
that's probably the most important thing you need to know about this. I'll show you quickly. So a couple of ways you can do that. You can automate things in Facebook Messenger. You can automate things in a CRM, Customer Relationship Management Software, which is email automation. So here's a quick screenshot, if you can see it, of behind the scenes. We build some messenger automation for people. Um, if you go to our website, actually, and you go, there's two buttons on our website, which is minusocial.com.au. There is a book a strategy session button, but there's also one called something like chat to us or talk to us or something. It's in, it's in the first thing that you see when you get to the website. Um, click on that and that will take you through an example of a Facebook Messenger chat just to see how that works. And that's basically a way of filtering through people so that you don't have to talk to everybody, you just talk to the ones who are interested. Then this is an example of email automation that we build. It looks complicated, it actually isn't really that complicated. It's all just drag and drop stuff where you get sequences of, you go, okay, they come in, if they watch this video, send them this email, if they open this email, and you guys will have all experienced this in the last week or so with the promotion that we did for this. So depending on what action you took, whether you opened the email, whether you didn't open the email, whether you clicked to register for the this session, or whether you registered, you got different stuff. So if you clicked to register and you didn't register, then you would have got a reminder that said, hey, this thing is coming up, you should register. If you registered, you would have got something that said, here's your link. So that's how you build this kind of stuff. It means that once you've built it, the humans don't have to do anything. You can just set it up and only talk to the people at the end that want to talk to you. Here's a quick example of, this is a cool thing, We actually blend the email automation together with the Google Ads or the Facebook Ads. So you imagine somebody, you get an audience, you show them some ads and they go, oh, I want to do your diploma of hairdressing. They then fill out their form to inquire and you send them some emails, but they don't do anything with the emails. So after, say, four or so unopened emails, you go, I better give them a bit of a kick along. So you drop something else into their Facebook feed, which is a video testimonial or something. And they go, oh, they see that and they go, that's right, I inquired about that, where is that? So you're sending them backwards and forwards between Facebook and email until they're ready to talk to you. No point in talking to them in this early stage, get them warmed up and then talk to them. So you can build this and it's all automatic. Um, I will skip over this. This was just a little campaign, an email campaign that we've been running for the last week or so, um, just to give you an example. So there was a sequence of emails, 31% of them got opened, blah, blah. Those numbers in the bottom half of the page are how many people are in each stage of the, the process at the moment. So they've come in, 145 got to the course guide, some have downloaded them, some have booked a, booked a call, some have requested that somebody call them. Um, then there's 270 have ended up across the other side being nurtured. So this of these couple of hundred people in the last seven days, they've only the, the RTO has only had to talk to seven and it's got 41 who want specific things emailed. So it reduces their, their time load. Um, probably haven't got time to go through these recent projects. We've got seven minutes to go. This is some stuff we did for people who got their lead cost from $50 down to five. I'll, I'll skip through these and I'll go to the six things that you can do today. That's probably more important. Um, you'll see these anyway if, if you get the slides. Okay, six things you should do right now today. First thing is add the Facebook and the Google retargeting pixels to your website. If your website is built in WordPress, it's really easy. You just get a plugin called uh, Google Tag Manager. You add that to your WordPress and that's like a bucket that you can chuck all your targeting codes into. So put Google Tag Manager on WordPress and then just go to Facebook and get pics and Google and get the pixels. If you want to know how, I'll send you a little video on how to do it. It's really easy. I'm not a programmer and I can do it. Um, if you're using paid ads, don't run them unless you're driving this traffic to a specific optimized landing page that's got a clear call to action. Otherwise, you're wasting your money. I mean, you're probably making some enrollments out of it, but you could get a lot better and you could change that a lot quicker. So build one quick landing page. The, um, the email automation platform that we use, you can actually build landing pages in that. So if you're using something like that, you'll probably find you can do it. Um, if you haven't got Google Analytics switched on, switch them on. Um, go and have a look at them because Google Analytics will tell you everything about your website visitors. Like where do they go and what do they do? What page do they land on? How long do they stay? Where do they go after that? What do you do? Um, someone just asked me what we're building our landing pages in. We're actually building them in our CRM, which is Infusionsoft. So, and that way they link up straight away to the emails. And then we've got a little product, a platform that we use to join it up to Facebook. Um, Andrew, if you want to know more details, I'm happy to show you how that happens. 
or anyone else. So um, turn on your analytics because you want to know what your website visitors are doing, what they're interested in, what they're reading. The other part of that is um, adding a heat map to your website. So if you go Google heat map, there's some free heat map products. Um, they will show you visually where people are going, how far down they're scrolling, all that sort of stuff. Um, set up Facebook Business Manager. Just Google Facebook Business Manager, follow the links, do what it tells you, because then you can look at your audiences and stop boosting posts in Facebook. It's a waste of money. Okay, one last thing just to wrap up and then I'll answer the couple of questions that are there. So, as you know, now this is what we do. We're consultants, we set this stuff up. Um, we do a bunch of different things, anything from $209 for that email automation platform that we're talking about and we'll give you a bit of consulting thrown in because we get a commission from the email automation people um, and then up to like I don't know 7,000 or more to set up the whole system for you um, so if you want to have a chat I'm happy to chat on call or email or go to our website or whatever um, even if you're not going to be a client of ours I'm still happy to share some of this stuff I think it's really cool um, if you're interested in chatting about us doing something for you then obviously send us a message we're happy to talk now let me just check the questions and see that I've answered okay so a couple of people wanting an example of a good landing page if you guys want to email me and remind me when I get back to, from New Zealand in a couple of days, I will send you a few screenshots of some good ones and tell you why they're good ones if anyone wants those. Um, yeah, Andrew Mercado is good. That's That does exactly the same stuff as we're talking about. Right, three minutes. Any other questions? Is anybody still here? Everybody's still here. Awesome, thank you. Um, are your brains still working? Sorry, I might have overdone the... So um, last thing I would really like to know, because this is the first time that we've done it, is, um, is this useful? Was it worthwhile? Did you think we should do it again? Would you like to do more? Um, I thought we'd give it a try. I spent a lot of time talking to people one-on-one -on, -one on the phone and I thought well, maybe we should just try this. So if you've found something helpful out of it, then I would really be grateful if you let me know. If there's something that you didn't find useful, please be honest as well. Like if I got too much into the blah, blah of the technology or anything, then tell me and I'll try not to do that again next time. I get, I, my original degree was in like chemistry and maths and I tend to get a bit geeky. Oh yes, Claire, the slides. So if you want the slides and if you want the audio as well, just um, message me and email me is probably the easiest way and I'll send you back a link. Um, and anything that you need out of this, just email me and I will send it to you. Thank you very much, everybody. It was really nice talking to you. Kind of weird talking into the black hole of, you know, not being able to see people. We're all trainers and we're all used to seeing faces. Um, Jill, can you use this for international students? Um, yeah, there's some interesting stuff. That's probably a whole different topic, actually. We've been doing some interesting things in terms of recruiting in-country students and not having to use agents. A little bit harder when you're recruiting them from overseas. You can still do all of this, but the chances are after they've done all this, they're probably going to go to the agent anyway because you know they want to get the migration stuff sorted. Um, but there are some things you can do. You can use part of this and you can certainly use it if you want to get in-country students who are here doing English language and stuff like that to get them to come over. So message me. I'm happy to tell you what I know about that. It's probably a separate topic. Thank you, everybody. We should go before the thing cuts us off. Um, thanks and have a good day.